Hey, welcome back to Outdoor Man. This is the second part of Life's a Bore podcast with Brendan. Uh, Brendan, don't forget to go to www.lifesabore.com or Google Life's a Bore. I'm off pig hunting. Um, check him out. He's brilliant. So yeah, back in and uh, hope you enjoy. Um, but yeah, that social media has changed hunting in so many ways. Um, it's, cha- it's changed the world, not just hunting. It's yeah, generic. it's the same the same things. Yeah, that anim- anonymity where people can just attack people, but just the way, yeah, the, the way like where we're sitting now, the, America's imploding, isn't it? The place has gone crazy and mm-hmm. mainly due to social media. Um, so yeah, so the hunting thing, I just, I, I hate to talk myself up. I've never been one to... I don't take praise well, and if I, I think one thing, if somebody tells me I can do something, I kind of knock myself down and, and don't think I can do it. If somebody tells me I can't do something, that's when I'll really try and do it. And so when I first made my first film, one of my mo- motivating factors was my mother-in-law. Um, we got into a big argument. Actually, I should tell this story. It's a good story. This might be a long one. Um, we we had we had made the first film, Life's a Bore, and it was like ninety nine percent made, and I just needed to get one more one more clip for it, one one more bore would have made that film because we wanted to make it really good. We were, you know, it was our first one we'd ever made, and you know, so I I thought now nah, we need one more pig to make it better, and I had this trip lined up that had been lined up for quite a while, um, it just happened to coincide with my wife ready been ready to give birth <laughs> to our third child and um but she knew how much was riding on this one hunt and we'd planned it but so i can't remember whether she had the baby early or she had the baby late whatever happened it happened right on the day that i was supposed to go away for this this hunting trip and um so we drove from where we are now back to our hometown wellington was about like four hours away while she was in labor so she could have the baby around her parent her mother and um so so nicole was cool with it she knew that i had to go hunting and it was just bad timing she was supposed to ring her mum and let her know that um that i was going to drop the kids there and go hunting so anyway so she had the baby at like eight o'clock in the morning half an hour later i said okay i'm off i'm going hunting and she was fine so i went up to her parents place and i dropped with our two other kids our son and our daughter, and I went around to the mother-in-laws and father-in-laws, and I was just talking to them. And then I said, "Okay, I'm off." And I just won, and so I just left the kids there, walked out the door, and went hunting. And I thought they knew; they didn't know anything about it. Anyway, so we, we went on this hunting trip, and it turned out that the guy who we were hunting with, he um, there's a whole documentary about him. He was like a psycho. He had some, and maybe why we were even there, he had some woman in a little cave on his property and he just yeah and he did all sorts of crazy stuff you know and um and they've had, they had him as a main suspect in a murder and i read somewhere that they reckon he would be new zealand's worst serial killer this is so my daughter my youngest daughter whose birth i left to go and hunt with a serial killer she never lets me forget that one <laughs> and uh, so he was fine i i didn't know any of this at the time i i remember the guy who i was hunting with so we were just hunting on this guy's land and um, and I guess in old English law, squatting rights, he'd taken over this massive block of land in the middle of nowhere. Actually, where he lived, there's a place called the Bridge to Nowhere because it was uh, the early settlers made a little a settlement there. One account I read of it was that when they made the settlement, it was during the war and they, they weren't allowed guns or something because of the war going on. So the pigs just took over these farms just destroyed them because pigs that once they're in and they lose their fear of you they they can be pretty ferocious and pretty um adaptable so they and so the, these people just walked off this land and so so there was this bridge and everything that goes into this massive big concrete bridge and now it's called the bridge to nowhere because everyone deserted it anyway this guy the serial killer serial rapist nutter um had just walked in there and that with squatters rights had taken over this this huge chunk of land and um and he owned it because he just took it over and uh, so yeah so we hunted with him 
And I didn't know any of his background, but the guy I was hunting with at some point said to me, he said, there's some pretty big holes on this place. So I think he knew something about it. Um, and so we stayed with this guy and he seemed pretty normal to me. But at the, the, my, I thought he just wanted to impress you the way he talked. You know, I, I'm pretty good judge of characters, but I'm glad I didn't cross him. Yeah. It turned out, so he went to trial, but he um, got let off because of dementia and then he just died. He was... But yeah, it was a it was a crazy sort of a setup. We got that, but we got that good pig, and we um we um finished that first film. And well, so how I managed to go off on that tangent um was my mother. When I went back after that hunt, I went back to her house and just walked into a firestorm because they were just going because <laughs> I just left the kids there. I just up and left. I'm back for like three days, <laughs> and um. And so me and the her, the mother in law just had it out, and I she ended up kicking me out. But she said to me, she said, "You're not even going to make a film. This is just an excuse to go hunting." And and that I think I don't know whether I would have done it for twenty years if it wasn't for that. Because after that, we, our, our relationship was very old for a long time after that, um, and we're fine now. But it took it took like maybe for twenty years, maybe of that. Um, and so perhaps that was one of my driving forces why I made so many films is because I it was just like I'm going to show you so <laughs> yeah, there we go there's one story I've got so many I've done some I've been so lucky in, in what, I, what I've got to do and the way people have treated me around the world um, just complete strangers just look after me and then take me hunting and some of them you know they want to they just want to be on a film. Um, but other, it was just, they were just really nice. You know, I, the, the majority of people you meet are really nice. And I try and do the same. Like if I see hitchhikers or something, I'll always pick them up and go the extra mile. Like if, I'll have complete strangers stay at my house just because that's what, how I've been treated my this whole time. Like I went to Hawaii for the first time and well, not the first time I went there surfing when I was a kid, but I went there for the first time hunting just before December and I was treated like a rock star. Like it was unbelievable. It was humbling, but it was just unbelievable. And it was kind of at times too much. You just, I, I don't think all I do is I carry a camera around and film pigs, but it's opened up some doors and, and my, actually my wife. So our reason for coming back to New Zealand from Australia was I just wanted to, um, cause like people would thought I'd had the dream job. And one, one aspect I had, have had the dream job you know i've just gone hunting for a living and at times it was quite good at other times we really struggled like and now we've got hard you know basically no money but i'm not that attached to money but um it wasn't i i knew i was lucky doing what i did but i hated leaving home and i hated going and seeing all these really awesome places because some of the places i've been are just breathtaking um that no, so many people will never get to see and I got to hunt there, some awesome places. But I, 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 I've been, I got married when I was nineteen. We've been married for I'm forty seven now, so we've been married a long time, and we're best friends. And so I'd go to these places, but it just, I just, it wasn't the same not having my wife there because I've seen all these awesome things, but I didn't even want to tell her about them because she, yeah, I just felt bad. And and so that's why we um, came back to New Zealand as I saw an opportunity to film and travel and go world and do it online um, and hunt. We had places like France and Hawaii and everywhere lined up to go. Um, our daughters were both travel agents, so we got really cheap flights. Um, and then COVID hit and yeah. Yeah. can't leave. Um, so we did travel New Zealand. We got it. We got just like a, a little people mover. I don't know, over here, the, the Brethren Church, you know, you have exclusive Brethren over there, the ones that wear the scarves and have massive families. They have churches with no windows. They're, they're a little bit cultish. Anyway, not, yeah, so they, not, not. you know, like look like little space shuttles. They've been around. So we got one of those and decked that out, made beds in there. And so me, my wife, it's only like a six-seater or something. That was our house for I don't know how long. We traveled around New Zealand and we'd just go and stay with people and go hunting. I'd go hunting and she got to see all these places. So it was really good. Um, but that's what our plan was, was to do that around the world with our cheap flights. Because the flights were pretty cheap through our daughters. Um, one was in a flight attendant in Australia. One was in New Zealand. So 
Um, but yeah, COVID happened and they've both lost their jobs and um, yeah. So now, and that's part of the reason I'm, I'm looking at a change in career as well. Um, I, I was over it. I had, yeah, making a living out of killing things. I know we're both hunters and most of my friends are hunters, but it just, yeah, it had kind of lost its shine. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't remember the last time I actually killed a pig. I was just film with other people and so that was my style of filming was just to film other people i never considered myself i i i do know a fair bit about dogs and a fair bit about hunting but just because i've been lucky enough to hunt with some of the best hunters out there um so i never like to make the films about me like i said i don't like to um talk myself up and i think probably that's part of my downfall in my business models is with social media and that you have to really pump yourself up and be posting on Instagram and look at me, look at me. And I think that kind of started to wear thin on me as well. Um, just doing things yeah. I didn't fit my moral compass. I'm, I, I don't, I, I don't see anything wrong with people doing that. Um, I just can't compete with it because it doesn't sit well with me. And so I'm get, just getting left behind. Um, but yeah, if people want to see some of my stuff you can sign up to my website, get free seven days and just, cut it off after seven days but there's i've made so many films I've, like i've sold footage to like discovery channel and things like that over the years um so yeah it's been a good life it just hasn't yeah. been um, it hasn't been financially rewarding when i did at one point we were making quite a bit of money when we first started selling films in australia we just came with a completely different business model we went from we used to make dvds and sell them for they were phenomenally expensive the first guy I was in business with, Jason Down, that I made the Lice and Boar films with, we're still friends now, um, but I walked away from that. But he was more the business-minded one. Where um, And so our, our DVDs used to be $50 each. Oh, yeah. So it would be $50, which is phenomenal. And then so we went from that. When I left Lice and Boar, because it, it just had, was so different from a business, from a personal sense, we kind of clashed. And we um, and I walked away, but then we started and I started a new company um, doing the same thing, but we dropped the price down to fifteen dollars, and then had them. You could walk into a news agent. Do you have news agents here? It's like a yeah, mag yeah. magazine shop. Walk into a magazine shop, and our DVDs would be in there, and um, we were selling those for fifteen dollars. And because they were so accessible then, ra rather than people having to order them online, people would just go into a shop and grab one. Our sales just went just took off and I've never had money in my life. So we were selling 8,000 films. So we were uh, 8,000 films per film. We were doing four films a year. Then we jumped it up to six. Then we actually jumped it up to 12. Um, so at times, but then, then the internet rose. And so DVD sales dropped, but um, I'd never had money in my life. And so I just blew it. I, I, I took the kids to, over to Australia and we went and did roller coasters. And if there was, I've got a thing for guitars and I, I just had never had money. The kids had never had money, so I just spoiled them. And I don't regret it in one sense because I, I think they, they they will look back on it fondly. I look back on it fondly, but I think my wife looks back on it and just thinks, man, why did I not take control of the situation and save some of this money? Because we've never owned a house or anything. We live in a house bus actually at the moment. We're through lockdown, we've just lived in a house bus. And, um, but, That's yeah. That's got to be tempting. Um, what? well, it's better than living in a car. We lived in a car for a bit, so it was like moving from a from a shed to a mansion. Yeah, and, but yeah. it has it's been we, the whole of lockdown. We were in it, and yeah, it um, it was a it was an impulse buy on her behalf. She just brought it because she liked the look of it, and it's so old and it leaks. And um, yeah, it's been a trial. So yeah, it, it has been tested. It, yeah, so we're actually um Monday, so tomorrow. I think Monday's tomorrow. Tomorrow we're actually leaving and going and back to my parents' farm to go and help out on the farm and live in a house for a bit. And um, yeah, and there's actually the, there's pigs turned up on my parents' farm, which is really cool because it never has been. Um, yeah, in New Zealand, a lot of people breed pigs and let them go, which yeah. I think is it's it's illegal, but it's they don't you can't get caught in Australia. It was huge fines. You didn't do it in Australia, like in, in Australia. When 
the first time I filmed in Australia because I had all my New Zealand mentalities um, of, you know, you don't kill them unless you're going to eat them and all that. Um, but the other thing was, if you caught a sow, we just always let them go. And so I was convincing these Australians to let these things, these pests go. They could have got huge fines for and um, and filming it and then sitting it out to thousands of people. And I got, we made my first Australian film. We wanted to make it as good a film as we could. Um, and I didn't want anything. I wanted it cheap. I wanted it accessible. I wanted, I was because most people in Australia use those harder dogs, the big, Full mastiff cross and things like that. We put more holding. Whereas in New Zealand films, we never had holding. We tried to steer away from the holding dogs just for the animal rights side of it. Um, we didn't want to be responsible for bringing pig hunting down. Um, and yeah, so we made this film perfect in every way, except that we were letting these pigs go, and I got crucified, <laughs> not by animal rights activists, by um, by other hunters. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I learned that one pretty quick. But, um, yeah, I told you, if you get me talking, it's hard to make me stop. Hey, <laughs> you, you can ask some questions. Or I'm sorry, it's been awesome. <laughs> totally um, fun. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Is anything you want to talk about particularly? I got so You've covered, you've covered everything on my list and more. <laughs> really um, have, and that's been great. Yeah, uh, one one thing up in that top end of Australia, hunting with crocodiles. That's a that's a pretty cool sort of a those yeah. things. They're just like having dinosaurs, but not not just dinosaurs. Dinosaurs that are stalking you because they'll come motoring across a um, waterway. They they love dogs. I actually um, when I say how lucky I've been and and what I've done. I've got to do so many things. One of them was we went and, and um, were going to hunt crocodiles. And and like the crocodiles are well, like really protected, huge fines if you shoot a crocodile, but you can get permits if they're causing trouble, like they'll eat cattle. You know, like a crocodile will grab a cow yeah. and eat it. Um, so I was lucky enough to go um, croc hunting with one of the original crocodile hunters from Australia. He was a guy from Zimbabwe. I was hunting with his kids. I'll give you, I might as well go into the whole story. Um, it's crocodiles, not, not, um, there's no crocodiles or snakes or anything in New Zealand, nothing at all. Not uh, so we went to Australia and, and hunting around these crocodiles and I was, you were kind of scared of snakes and scared of crocodiles and scared of spiders. I got used to that pretty quick. I love snakes now. Um, but crocodiles, I just had no um, idea about them. And so I would just trust the people I was hunting with. So I was up there and I was, um, and I've been hunting and I was at a service station filling up on gas and whatever, what have you. And there was a guy in the queue in front of me, just covered in mud, just a young kid. And I, and he turned around and I said to him, I said, Oh, you look like you've had a good weekend. And, um, he said, Oh, you make those DVDs, don't you? And, um, and he said, Oh, he said, you know, yeah, for a hunt. He turned out to be, he was a helicopter, um, mechanic, just a young kid. But so he worked on this massive station with all these helicopters. And he said, you come out and we'll go around in the helicopter and we'll um, we'll go and drop you, we'll get you some good footage and stuff. So the next day, I'm sitting in a helicopter with this guy that I'm and uh, flying over these floodplains. So to the top end of Australia is, is really flat and there's only two seasons. There's a dry season and a wet season. And when it rains, and it just floods these whole areas, these flat areas just get covered in water and these crocodiles will move into the, all these little waterways and there's like thousands of crocodiles up there because they're protected so they're out of control. Um, and so first hunt we went with were these young kids. So their father was one of the original crocodile hunters in Australia. He was a bit mad and these kids had grown up around crocodiles and was so relaxed around them but so, so me not knowing anything about crocodiles, we just go for a hunt and we go down to this, they call it a billabong, it's just a water hole and, and pigs need water, pigs don't sweat apparently, um, so they they have to have water and when you're in Australia, you can there can be huge areas and it's just desert, but you'll find these pools of water and the pigs have to be there because it's so hot that if they move too far away from there, they'll just die. So anyway, see, so the one... One mode of, oper of operation when you're hunting in, in parts of Australia is you just drive around to those waterholes. 
you just pull up in your in their big utes. They'll have the dogs on the back, big massive dogs with all the armor plating on, and just see a pig, let the dogs go. So the, completely different to how we hunt in New Zealand. Just there wasn't a lot of hunting in it. You were just kind of driving around and spotting them. Anyway, so we get to this first the first pig hunt I went on with these young fellas. There was two of them. They shone the light across this billabong, and there was pigs there. And so they just let the dogs go, and off they went. And they just ran straight across this water. And because I'm always filming, you can't run and film. So because there was action going on, there was pigs and there was dogs chasing, there was guys running, I had to stop and just stand still and film it. And so I filmed them running across in the dark. They got to the other side, the dogs caught the pig, and then I knew, right, I've got to go. And then I just sort of thought, well, there can't be crocodiles here because they just ran across it. And so I turned my light on and I ran across the water. We got across there, the dogs had the pig. And then I just said to him, I said, oh, is there no crocodiles in that water? And he said, he just turned around. He said, oh, I don't know. We didn't look. He said, when we go back, we'll turn the light on. And you'll see their eyes. And so there's a chance there could have been a crocodile in there. And, but, and so, to, so I rang one of my other friends who was from up there. And I just, and I told him that story. And he said, mate, he said, there, you're in the home of crocodiles there. The river that feeds those when they flood. The river that feeds all those water holes and, and leaves those puddles is a place where they do tours called Jumping Crocodiles. It's a place called Adelaide River. And so the tourists will go there and these crocodiles, these boats will go down and these crocs will jump up and grab meat off the side of these boats. So he said, yeah, you're in the home of crocodiles. He said, no water there is safe. Any puddle holder. So we, went, we carried on hunting the next day and we got it. So we drove around. We got we actually flying around in a helicopter and the guy um dropped us off with our dogs we see some pigs he dropped us off and he flew away and he and then he he got away and he called us on the on a radio and he said um he said get brennan to wait for me i'm going to come back um he's got to come and see this and he flew us off and there was like a five meter long crocodile just sitting on this bank sure, um, yeah. and then and then so he dropped me back with these guys and we carried on hunting and out in the middle of, again in one of these billabongs and it was a massive billabong like a huge one like probably what you'd call a lock in Australia. It was huge. Um, I mean, in, in Scotland. Um, and there was a pig out in the middle eating. They like to eat the the lilies, the water lilies. They'll eat the bulbs. So they just go out there and just dive in the water. And crocodiles will eat pigs. You know, they love pigs. So we seen this pig out in the middle, these young fellas. Um, so we pulled up and they sent their dogs across. So their dogs go running across this water. And they must have been, they would have been 100 metres out probably. Maybe uh, maybe just the fear of it, I, I've exaggerated, but I'd say 100 metres out, just running through the mud. And again, they got this pig and they dragged it out. And um, they were like, up to maybe their chest or in, in mud. Anyway, they, they came back out and, and I, I said, um, I said, oh, there no crocodiles in this one? He said, oh, there's a monster in here. I've seen it from the helicopters. And, um, and I said, well, what? He said, oh, the mud, he said, we would have seen it coming if it came. And I said, yeah, you've seen it coming, but that not mean you can outrun it in 100 feet <laughs> dash and mud. But they were that casual. Um, and, and again, I rang my mate and told him that story. And he, I said, oh, no, I wasn't going anywhere near the water. I just stood by the bank. And he said, how far from the bank did you stand? And I said, oh, I was probably two meters. He said, you ain't safe there either. I'll just grab it. I'll just come out and off the banks. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, we also go with that story. Um, crocodiles. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I've, I've, I've went too far off on a tangent there. Too far. That's awesome. That's awesome. But yeah, cro crocodiles are scary. But just taking for granted um, that you think the hunters know what they're doing. Like with snake identification, I'd just say, what sort of snake is that? And they'd say, but then I, I look back later and I think, they probably had no idea what sort of snake it was. They're not like snake. Just make the shit up and you go along. <laughs> so, yeah, so going to Australia was an awesome place. Um, yeah, I loved it. My missus would move back there at the drop of a hat just for the weather. And the people were awesome. Australians are really awesome. Um, yeah. But, yes, pigs everywhere over there. Like, yeah. It, it 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 lost its the hunting lost its charm I think in one sense because we weren't eating them I felt I always felt guilty about that, um, and just that it was just so different that um, that approach of catching so many pigs so quickly and leaving them there 
with that and no and not having that hunt aspect not working for it so yeah yeah the hunt is the thing it's like treasure hunting or you know that's why i think when i said hunting must fulfill so many primal urges i think you get so many things you're exploring you're you're gathering you're providing um dare i say it probably killing is probably something that is in us as well you know we did it to survive for so long um especially the english yeah 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 they, they killed our people not our, <laughs> not our animals they brought people and killed they brought animals and killed the people <laughs> yes uh, yeah. yeah um so as i said I, I go off on tangents i've got so many i'm just, I'm, I'm trying to think if I could think of a. There's some standout stories, but there's so many of them. Um, no, it's, been, it's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, no worries. It's been it's probably been, too long it's, it for you. I'll, 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 what I'll do is I'll split this into two, probably. Yeah. And, if uh, you want any, I can't uh, get rid of any of it because it's it's been it's been an app, it's been fantastic listening. It really has. It's something so out of the ordinary for the likes of me. It's. Yeah. Is there anything from an English perspective? Um, about pigs, because yeah, I know you used to have pigs there, didn't you? Yeah, we've got them. We've got them. I know they're in Wales, um, and uh, that's a Google it to where the rest of them are. They're, they're sort of pockets in the UK. And and with um, your laws, where you're not allowed to hunt them, that's going to come back. They're shot. You. They're it shot. Come back. Yeah, oh, yeah. But yeah, um, that, you leave those I things to their own to devices, and, yeah, leave them to their own devices. They just take over. Like you yeah. see in, um, I know in lockdown and that, and in Fukushima in Japan, you know, the nuclear city. Yep. Um, they, I, I read articles where the pigs have just taken over because there's no people there. Pigs just roam in the streets. I almost, when I was in Japan, I, I had to draw the line. I was kind of keen to go there to Fukushima and um, film them. But I didn't, you know, I had to sort of think, hang on, this it's like a nuclear disaster site. It's probably not a good idea. Um, but yeah, pig, in, in Japan, yeah, when I was in Japan, Japan was awesome. Um, we we hunted with some Japanese hunters who, um, I think they were quite wealthy and possibly part of the Yakuza, you know, the Japanese mafia. Yeah. They had a lot of, my friend said they were, they, they had some pretty good contacts. But anyway, so they took us hunting. Like, and when I say wherever I went in the world, I was just treat, treated like royalty. And it was crazy, um, but so good. But they took us out to some really flash sushi restaurant. And while we were sitting there, luckily I had my camera, but on the on the news, there's a pig run through a shopping mall and and, oh, and wow. attack people. And yeah, because pigs to Japan, they're, nat they're native there. They've always been there. And any, like a phenomenal amount of animals in Japan, um, like any sport with a bush would probably have pigs in it. The samurai used to hunt them. So you're walking around with all this history it was and it was really awesome but yeah yeah, pig, much, yeah you leave pigs alone like in england if they the animal rights people were saying now nah, leave them um yeah they can take take off pretty good and, and i i know i'm going to bite into your time a little bit more here again but i'll tell you a story <laughs> um a, a place here where i hunted a lot <clears throat> just a farm uh, the front block of it got sold and these vegans brought it and um i always try and get along with anyone and i got on all right with them i under i you know, respect their views and things like that. But so they were trying to get the land back to its natural state and they grow, planted all these trees and gardens and were living off the land and doing their honourable thing in their eyes. And anyway, um, so they, they were against killing. Um, the, the, actually, the way I first met the guy when he first moved in is I, because I was allowed to hunt the farm that they, they were at the front of and my dogs caught this little pig and it was squealing. And so I was running over to get it, and he, because he was this big animal rights guy, came running past me with a gun heading towards my dogs. And you know what? It's, your dogs are like your family. You don't touch Yeah, yeah. I just said to him, you touch those dogs, and there's going to be some trouble. I don't know what I was going to do, but but I didn't know what he was going to do either. He he wasn't going for my dogs. He said, I'd never hurt a dog. Um, so it was a it was a tense first meeting, but we got to be friends and we would talk to each other. And um, he said, "No, I'd never heard a dog. He was just going to rescue the pig, I guess." Which, yeah, fair enough. I was going to rescue the pig as well. I hated I hate hearing pigs suffer. Um, anyway, um, so they would plant in these gardens, and the pigs would just come in, 
and they would go and, and start eating their vegetables and, yeah, root and, they all would up. and chase them off. But once a pig knows you can't do anything to it, if a pig loses its fear of you, they're a fearsome animal. So these animal rights activists, they ended up having to get pig hunters in because there was just nothing they could do. They had to kill these pigs because they were just destroying the place. <laughs> and I thought it was, it was ironic and it was funny. But yeah, they can do so much damage. And it's another thing with these animal rights people. Like, like I say, I respect their view, but they've got to understand how hypocritical it can be. In Australia, we hunted in sugarcane a lot. Um, probably one of my favorite places to hunt because it's so hard to hunt in. But these pigs destroy sugar because it's, you know, they just get, then they get really big and really fat. And all they'll do is they'll just crunch the bottom of the, of like sugar grows in cane, you know, three times the size of me or whatever. And they'll, they'll just bite the bottom of it, chew it, get the sugar out of it, and then they'll just spit it, spit out the wad. So when you're hunting, you're just finding these big balls of like chewed up bamboo looking stuff. And the wetter it was, you knew the fresher it was. Um, and and they would just take one bite, and then move to the next stalk and just destroy it. But so all these animal rights activists, the one thing they have to understand that no matter what food, whether they're eating grain or corn, or I've hunted in corn, I've hunted in sugarcane, I've hunted in cotton, cotton fields. Um, there's blood in everything they eat because it all has to be pest controlled, whether it's with poison or whether it's with dogs or whether it's shooting um, or driving, no matter what they do, driving their cars, everything has its, its impact. So I, yeah, I don't like the way that I, I understand why they don't like us hunting, but it's just so hypocritical that <clears throat> a lot of the hunting we were doing was to, to protect the crops that they're consuming. And yeah, they think, they think but yeah, I don't know. One of the things we've had in up in Scotland is it's, it's a problem at the moment. Is they've been putting deer fencing up around the woods yeah. to try the trees and that grow. But what it's actually done is channeled the deer, and all of a sudden there is a lot more accidents on the road because the deer are following all these these fence lines. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're on the main road and it's a bit of a straight yeah, out, yeah. straight into the vehicles. Yeah. That's been an interesting one for us. You should, if you ever go to Australia, you want to drive just on dark along some backcountry road and see how many kangaroos they'll jump into the side of your car. Yeah, well, they're really well, they're, they're, they're not the brightest, so they'll be hopping along beside you. And some of them are huge, like six foot high, they'll jump into the side of your car. And yeah, I wrote one car off driving to go hunting. I'd only just insured it on the day I left for that trip, I insured it and um, yeah, smashed a roo with it. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, um, I, I, I didn't think I would be going into stories. I thought I'd be talking more facts and. Uh, no, it's been, it's been, it's been absolutely yeah. fabulous. Thank you very much. Yeah, I should have. I'll, if, if you ever want to do a part two, um, I'll think about some stories because I've got. I, I know, I know in the back of my head, too. I've got some phenomenal stories, but I've just kind of gone blank on them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll um right. I'll say thank you very much, and I'll stop recording and then say thank you again. So thank no you very much for doing it. It's been yeah, good luck. Support.